Our next speaker is David Magerman. He is the managing partner at Differential Ventures. He's a founding manage manage managing partner at Differential Venture Partners, an early stage technology investment firm focusing on data science driven startups. Prior to Differential, David was head of production at Renaissance Technologies, one of the key architects and engineers of their equities research and trading systems. His 1994 PhD thesis for his degree in computer science from Stanford University produced groundbreaking research in data science to machine learning and statistical modeling to solve problems in natural language processing. Please join me in welcoming David to the stage. Thank, thank you. Um, they didn't tell me I was following the founder of the conference as a speaker. That's uh, a tough act to follow. And, and I would have sprinkled, if I'd known religion was OK, I would have sprinkled Torah verses into my talk. But you'll have to just get by with the AI. Um, so my name is David Magerman. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, From IBM Research to Renaissance Technologies to Venture Investing, A Journey in AI. And I would have subtitled it AI, Slow Your Roll. A um, little bit of a skeptical. Uh, a point of view to counterpoint the previous talk. Uh, so my name is David Magerman. I used to work at one of the most successful quantitative hedge funds in the world, Renaissance Technologies. When I left Renaissance two years ago, one of my main goals was to try to find a way to share what I learned over the past 30 years of research and development of artificial intelligence to help the next generation of engineers, computer scientists, and entrepreneurs avoid some of the mistakes I made and to benefit, benefit from lessons I learned. If I had any regrets about my career, and I have many, my biggest regret is that I worked to a, at a secretive company where I couldn't publish in real time the things that I learned about how AI and math and information theory and computer science could solve real world problems. I founded Differential Ventures, a data science oriented venture capital firm, to begin the process of sharing that knowledge. And when I was asked to speak at this conference, I viewed it as a golden opportunity to share more of what I have learned over the years with a larger audience. So who am I? I started my academic career at Penn, where as an undergraduate, I worked on the first large scale tree bank project to collect annotated natural language text for research. You see, back in the 1980s and 1990s, we didn't have data. And computers were really slow. We didn't even really have the internet yet, at least not as we know it today. So if you wanted data that was clean enough and voluminous enough, to do AI research, you had to spend research money collecting it manually and then annotating it manually. In fact, what we call deep learning today, which seems to solve every problem under the sun, was just called neural networks back in the 80s and 90s. And we rejected it as a failure. The only problem with neural nets was that computers were too slow and there wasn't nearly enough data available to train them properly. We spent two decades trying to work around those problems and we did a meritorious job. But if we just waited for more data and faster computers, we could have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. I got my PhD at Stanford, although I didn't spend much time there. There were a, a lot of theoretical AI researchers and a lot of, uh, lots of entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurialism, but they didn't really overlap much. Since I wanted to do practical applied research for my PhD, I ended up going to IBM Research to do my thesis work. I worked in the IBM Re Speech Recognition Group, where they seemed to, to be doing uh, Sorry, I seem to be, they seem to be doing uh, cutting edge research on real world problems. At least they seem to be. And they were to a degree. And I learned an enormous amount about AI to do, uh, about how to do great AI work there. But ultimately, because of the state of computer, I'm sorry, I'm having a little uh, technical problem here. I apologize. Um, oops. <laughs> Oops, OK. Got yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just losing. My mouse isn't working, and I can't uh, seem to move my mouse around. Um, so I apologize for this technical difficulties. So I can't seem to scroll this window. Ah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> it's always important to have a good technical team. 
Um, so ultimately, so I figured out at, at IBM Research, ultimately because of the state of computers and data, they were doing state-of-the-art research, but on necessarily toy problems. While I finished my PhD research, two senior managers from the IBM group decided to do something actually useful with what they learned at IBM. They left to go work at Renaissance Technologies, a quantitative, quantitative trading firm founded by a world-class mathematician, Jim Simons. They eventually dragged a bunch of the more useful members of the IBM research group to join them, including myself. At Renaissance, I learned what it meant to write code that actually did things in the real world. Under Peter Brown's guidance, I was the lead architect of the equities trading platform, which was no small feat in 1995, since computerized trading wasn't really a thing yet. The testament to the design principles we used then is that the basic structure of the trading system that we developed in the late 1990s is still in use today. Now I am a founding managing partner at the venture capital firm Differential Ventures that invests in early stage technology companies focused around different aspects of data science, AI, and machine learning. So what have I learned? So at IBM, I learned important lessons about practical and impractical applications of AI. We had an extraordinary team of scientists from a broad set of disciplines, computer science, mathematics, physics, information theory, statistics. And we were trying to solve real world problems to build computer systems that could transcribe speech or translate text from one language to another. But there was something inherently impractical about what we were doing. So we were trying to build speech recognition systems when in fact the computers were too slow and storage was too big and expensive and there wasn't enough data to really succeed. In fact, we used a room full of computers to do tasks that we now do on our phones and in the cloud. We also tried to build machine translation systems when it turned out that the traditional solutions were good enough for the customers who bought them. And it, really surprisingly, reducing error rates from the AI actually made end-to-end -end translation worse since the human translators who were tr editing the output of the AI had a harder time correcting less error-prone tra prone translations. We were inventing complex solutions to difficult problems that disappeared when computers got faster, disk space got cheaper, and data became more plentiful. And I see some modern-day cautionary parallels in some fields that, are going, that we're looking at right now. Uh, for instance, quantum computing, people working on building algorithms for 50-qubit machines, when presumably, if we ever want to make progress on quantum computing, there'll be megabit, uh, megacubit machines, and probably a lot of the work we're doing now will be for naught. Also, if you look at uh, the research being done now and actually the applications being done in autonomous vehicle technology, presumably in the future, all cars will be autonomous. There won't be people driving. And so, so many of the research problems we're solving now in auto autonomous vehicles um, are about autonomous vehicles interacting with people dri human drivers. Um, and it seems like a lot of that technology will, be, will turn out to be misguided in many ways the way that the, the last 20 years of AI research, some of it's been misguided. Um, and finally, the uses of human behavioral data. Um, it seems likely, based on what's gone on in the last uh, few days, weeks, and months, uh, that the world will regulate human behavioral data in some ways, which will make a lot of the work we're doing on trying to monetize it um, illegal, if not uh, unethical and immoral. So the bottom line is, at IBM I learned that you don't spend too much money and effort solving problems that are going to go away when an obviously better technology comes along. And don't, don't build companies around technologies that are incompatible with the way human beings like to use them. So at Renaissance Technologies, I learned about the trade-offs between genius and engineering. Jim Simons, who is arguably the most influential American mathematician of the 20th century, rarely got to use his computational geometry genius at Renaissance. What he did use was his common sense understanding that math, statistics, and optimization theory actually worked. Many times over the years, uh, some of the systems we built stopped working. The modeling system started failing, portfolio optimization algorithms produced suboptimal portfolios, um, and risk management systems failed, and we started losing money. And we learned from people who had experience on other Wall Street firms that the problems we were having and the extent to which we were having them, many senior managers would have just simply shut us down. They would have said, what you're doing isn't working. We're going to move on, and we'll do something else. 
And typically, two years later, they would hire back the same kinds of people and rebuild what they'd thrown away. The difference between that and, and Jim Simons is that he trusted math, and he trusted the scientific method. And he trusted them enough never to shut us down. It, of course, helped to have a, a set of profitable systems that kept making money while we were uh, losing money at times. But uh, I digress. Um, So one of the main lessons that I learned at Renaissance was the limited value of extreme genius. Genius is valuable to a point, but engineering never stops being valuable. And we learned that you shouldn't pay, overpay 10 sigma geniuses, guys who are like out of this world brilliant, when three sigma geniuses are good enough. As an example, occasionally we would try hiring some world class mathematicians that Jim knew that were just pure theoretical mathematicians. And we said, let's throw some really hard problem at them and see what they can do with it. The problem was we had to throw a really good engineer and researcher who could code to help that pure mathematician with their work. And that researcher had to be smart enough to understand the math that the mathematician was developing. And in the end, we had two results. First of all, well, three results. First of all, the mathematician got really frustrated and ended up wanting to leave. Um, secondly, we really never got any useful results out of that team. And thirdly, the really smart and capable researcher that we assigned to do the coding for this mathematician ended up making no progress on research they could have done to produce valuable results that could have helped our system. So in the end, we find that more than smart enough quants and really good engineers are, are, are a recipe for success. Um, I remember one time when one of the most senior managers at the company called all the people under his management to a meeting for a pep talk. He said that what made us successful wasn't that we were smar smarter than everyone else. Other companies had smart people, maybe even smarter. He said, we were a great team. We had gr a great system for doing research, and we spent more time and energy on good, solid engineering than anyone else. So you can predict what happened. The researchers of the meeting freaked out, because of course all of them thought they were the smartest quants in the world. But the manager was right. Renaissance was successful because its geniuses were more than smart enough, and its engineers were more than good enough, maybe even great. And that combination is unbeatable. The final lesson I learned at Renaissance was the tried and true principle, keep it simple, stupid. Occam's razor, never assuming complexity where it isn't called for by evidence, was another guiding principle. You don't want to use fancy math or fancy AI when simple math or simple algorithms will suffice. As an example, when we built our original trading system in 1995, we used human readable ASCII files as our real-time database storage format. We actually traded off a system that used a database format of ASCII readable files. Why? Because the system crashed every 30 minutes or so. And the only way we could figure out why it failed was if we could read the database files. And the only way we could restart the, the trading system fast enough to keep trading and keep making money was if we could hand edit the files to remove the erroneous entries. The funny thing was, this design was so useful for so many other reasons, we never found a value in switching to a more complex data database storage format. Years and years later, we continued to reap the benefits of that simple s solution and thank the engineering gods that we never, knew, never moved away from it. So now I work in venture capital investing, where I see 40 to 50 new company pitch decks every week. And probably half of those are for companies doing something with data. What we see more often than not is that the most people using AI don't really know how it works. They see a business problem. They, they think AI will help solve it. And they pitch a company to do it. They figure they'll build the AI, AI once they get funding. The problem, as I learned at IBM and Renaissance, is that some problems don't actually benefit from applying AI to them or at least not the latest and greatest AI techniques. At Stanford, the old guard used to joke that AI was called AI until it worked. Then it was just called algorithms. <laughs> and there's lots of computer intelligence encoded in algorithms that aren't called AI anymore. But those more mundane approaches sometimes solve business problems just as well as newer AI, AI algorithms, or better. Also, even if your approach to AI works really well, what do you do when it stops working? If you don't understand deeply how the flavor of AI you're using works, you won't be able to diagnose the problems with it when it fails. I also see a lot of companies hanging their hats on, uh, off of 10 sigma geniuses. 
Be wary of a company whose product is relying on the cutting edge ideas of a single genius PhD. The PhD may be a genius, and the idea might be out of this world. But if you spend too much money and too much focus on the genius, you had better focus enough money and hiring resources on building out the engineering team that is going to implement and support the genius idea. And if you're planning on doing your own AI or machine learning in-house, you'd better make sure you buy good tools to organize your research and development, to put guardrails on your research team to make sure their work leads to usable results. So based on all these thoughts, what kind of companies do we invest in at Differential? We're focused mostly on investing in the infrastructure of data science. For instance, uh, we're, we're investing in a company called DataBand, which is, which is founded on, by experienced data scientists who recognized that data science research inside businesses tended to operate outside the guardrails of a traditional project management software. After investigating why, they discovered that data science R&D process is different enough from traditional R&D so that it didn't fit well within the confines of existing project man management tools. And in any case, data scientists just didn't like to use them. They would invent their own tools for development, and then once research was finished, the work would typically be re-implemented in the production environment. This process leads to all sorts of problems. So they formed DataBand to implement the best ideas they came up with to add structure to data science-oriented R&D. When I first saw their system, I wished I could have had it when I worked at Renaissance. It would have saved us a lot of time and a lot of tool building, tool building effort. We're also looking at investing in tools to speed up your computing resources and get the most out of your IT expenditures. So for example, Concertio is, Concertio is a company based on the principle that all the hardware and software we use consists of hundreds to thousands of configuration parameters. These parameters control the performance and efficiency of the hardware and software, but very frequently they are left at the factory settings, which can be very inefficient for, for most uses. Concertio developed hyperparameter optimization algorithms that their software deploys on different kinds of hardware and software to discover in real time what the best settings for the typical use of the, of the systems are. They can get across the board 10% speed ups on basic hardware regardless of use, and they can double the performance of systems or more when applied to specific repetitive uses of hardware and software. Concertio can save customers lots of money by maximizing the power of their existing IT infrastructure and delaying the need to upgrade their systems. Another thing we're investing in, we are actually investing in a couple of pure AI companies, but we're really focusing on AI companies whose strength is as much their engineering as it is their AI. So two examples are Ocarlis, which uses AI systems to convert unstructured financial data into useful information for analyzing different problems in the banking industry. Their innovation is that they are using crowdsourcing to supplement and error check the results of the AI data analysis, getting 99.9% .9 data accuracy with minimal cost. We're also investing in a company called Pienzo, which is a joint effort of two geniuses out of MIT. One of the co-founders is an AI researcher, and the other has a PhD focused on human-computer interaction. They're both high sigma geniuses, but they're also practical engineers who understand that each part of what they contribute is critical to the success of their company. They build systems that enable domain experts to train models using semi-autonomous learning techniques, but they do so with a world-class human com computer interface that rivals the value of the, the core AI technology. So one thing I wanted to caution everybody about, because it's something that's uh, near and dear to my heart, um, is the regulatory risk um, of the use of human behavioral data. Because AI powered tools right now are using a lot of human behavioral data in ways which are, is legal now, uh, but is being more and more constrained. Um, obviously, data science using human behavioral data it's ubiquitous, it's powerful, and it's profitable. Uh, examples of data I'm talking about are like location data, financial transaction data, your credit card history, uh, social media data, your personal audio and video that you post online, um, and even mobile phone usage, um, as, able, as uh, Facebook was found to be trying to scrape uh, use of cell phones from teenagers. But data science using human behavioral data is also dangerous, and like I said, likely to be regulated. There's been shocking, scandalous abuse of data that's being discovered seemingly daily and certainly weekly. Uh, there are a lot of examples. Facebook you know, famously uh, was caught using uh, data inappropriately with Cambridge Analytica that impacted uh, political outcomes around the world. Um, Amazon was discovered to be uh, using recordings from the record devices in inappropriate ways. 
Um, Facebook, again, was repeatedly violating their own privacy rules. Um, IBM, a few months ago, uh, was found to be using uh, location data that they uh, extracted and purchased from weather applications. Um, and they were anonymizing it to use it for uh, studying retail behavior and trying to identify real retail opportunities in real estate and, and, in, and in other companies. But what you found and what researchers found is that if you took individual anonymized data, uh, pieces of data, you could find that, let's say, one of the pieces of data, you know, user 8743, slept at Gracie Mansion for eight hours. And then in the next morning, that same user, uh, anonymized, would go to the gym that the mayor at the time would attend. And researchers basically figured out, and somewhat profitably so, that you can reverse engineer uh, these anonymized data sets and actually identify um, the people involved, sometimes to uh, uh, personal and disastrous effects. Um, and very recently, uh, Facebook was discovered to be transcribing um, messenger chats uh, in ways which they promised not to do. And we found that off-the-shelf deep learning applied to this human behavioral data can effectively manipulate people's behavior. Now, regulators and politicians are growing more and more aware of this, and regula regulations to restrict the use of this human behavioral data are clearly on the horizon. So what we tell companies that are using human behavioral data is the following. Do everything that is broadly considered legal and ethical to be competitive and profitable. But make sure your business model is flexible and you can pivot depending on how human behavioral data uh, becomes regulated. So in summary, I want you to walk away with two simple ideas. Artificial intelligence is a powerful tool that can be used in almost any industry where there is data infused with information that can help solve problems. That said, traditional business sense is a prerequisite for any AI-based company to succeed. And you can't expect a product to be useful in the short run or in the long run if it isn't built by a group of smart engineers who understand the problem they're solving and the idiosyncrasies of the techniques they're using to solve them. Thank you for listening.